fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. This is 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Oh, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dollar Store Dave is here. <laughs> I am here. You're here. I just yeah. got back from the dollar store. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Of so course. What did you pick up? Well, how many movies did you get today? 327. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the thing is that, that, that wouldn't make me go, no, he's, he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> You'd believe that. You have the car full of bags and movies. Yeah. And I, I don't know how your wife can stay, stay there. I don't know. No. She's my long suffering wife. She must drink a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get through the day. You know. To deal with me, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Anyway. <laughs> well, speaking of crazy, now we've got a returning writer, and he's got a new book out. It's called Descent, and it's a novel based on several true stories. So, Mr. Gary V. Brill, thank you for being here. Well, thanks again for uh, having me, Al. Dave, it's good to be back. You've got a really good voice. You should be on the radio. <laughs> I, well, you know, I spend a lot of years talking uh, into uh, microphones on uh, airplanes, so I feel very comfortable doing it. Were you, were you the guy that uh, wanted to fly since you were, like, 10 years old? Uh, five, actually. My dad, oh. <laughs> my dad was a, a career Army officer, and we used to vacation in Maine for the whole month because you get a month off as an officer. And when I was five years old, this guy was barnstorming hopping rides off a beach in china lake and next thing i know me and my little sisters and brothers jammed in this airplane and were flying around and from that moment on i knew exactly what i was going to do with my life what is it about flying that um that you love so much it, can you can you pin it down well there's there's two two aspects to it for me anyway I, I first off i always wonder why you wouldn't want to be able to go up and sail around and wheel and turn and dive and swoop like birds do but the other thing is you know i really have always wanted to see the world i'm an army brat as i said and and uh, we moved a lot but we always had to stay in the states because my dad had a sort of a top secret gig and uh so all of my friends went to germany and japan and all over the place we didn't but we moved all over the u.s so as soon as i could i hit the road and started seeing the world yeah it's interesting did it does that keep you into the nomad or transient lifestyle? Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean, I, I would have 12 changes of address in a couple of years. And, and, and there was a name for people like me, I mean, a nice name for people like me, <laughs> back in the uh, 40s and 50s, and I was what was called a gypsy pilot. I was just available for anybody who had an interesting airplane and a, and a wad of cash. But that, that leads to kind of like the stories in this book and – the different kinds of people that you run across when you're in that kind of a position or situation. Definitely, yeah. It, it, it makes some reference to, you know, the, the general expectation when you tell people you're a pilot, the first question is, oh, what airline did you fly for? And I flew for 30 different companies off over the years. Hustler Magazine was one, the Saudi Royal Family. <laughs> I did fly for some airlines, Japan Airlines and Evergreen and a couple others, but I wasn't much into the airline thing if i was out of join the air force or the navy hustler hustler needed people to fly like what were you flying well it's an interesting story we were flying a uh a lucky jet star it's a little four engine passenger or executive transport um and it was branded uh painted bright pink and the numbers were six nine hm and the interesting thing is it was elvis presley's old airplane and right, right now it's up on pylons in front of Graceland. I, and um, can I ask, did you see lots of wild things with that when you were doing that job, or was it just it's more a name than anything? Well, it was, uh, it was mostly moving uh, Mr. Flint or Larry. They always called him and his, and his family upper executives. But the wildest thing for me is we'd go to the office. He had like three floors uh, 
in that big city in L.A. I forget what it's called, the big high rises. And, and you go up and they were doing paste up on a giant wall with ladders. And it was all being done by grandmothers. <laughs> I, I found that pretty weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never you never know what's going on behind that yeah. that nice hat. What made you put together this book? Like, what what was it that you wanted to tell in this book? Was there a theme to this that you wanted to get to the reader? No, two things. I, I wanted to first off, anybody that I've known since I've been flying says, "Oh, you got to write these stories down. You got to write these stories down." And it's like yeah, nobody will believe them anyway. So I, I just make notes, and I've got logbooks and stuff. I wanted to do that, but I also wanted to explore what happens to somebody when they're really on their way up, when they've been through hell, and they're you know they've come out the other side whole. And they're starting to build their dream, and, and somebody just comes and yanks it out from under them. And, you know, what, what would be your reaction? I ask people, what, what would you do if all of a sudden it was all gone in a, in a blink of an eye? You know, what would you do? How would you handle it? Did you have a problem deciding which stories you wanted to tell? Uh, I There's a lot of more boring ones that a lot of pilots might find very interesting. And I, I go into the minutia of some of the airplane uh habits just just enough to sort of give people a taste of it without boring them and also to so the pilots that read it go oh yeah that's right that's right that's exactly right that's how you do that any stories that you didn't tell oh yeah about six thousand but the <laughs> the, op- the opening scene where the hero steve takes the airplane down to wave top uh height cruises down the uh, james river at two in the morning I did that. I mean, that, that's, that's straight out of my logbook. That was one of the most beautiful flights. Um, every, every word that I wrote about that is absolute fact. How much literary license do you take with uh, recalling these stories? And uh, do you, or, or can you be very accurate in, in uh, what happened in, in, in real life? Oh, I can be, I can be real accurate. Um, some of the stories aren't mine, like the, part where the guy comes and chips off the ice into his glass from his airplane and uses it to cool his scotch. That that was one of the other pilots. That wasn't me, but uh, it was still, it's a great airmail story, so I had to throw it in there. <laughs> but but I didn't it's tell the story easy. about uh, my girlfriend and I sort of making out uh, in a twin beach one night, and I happened to look out over the window or the sill, and we were directly over Philadelphia Airport at about 4,000 feet, and they must have been going absolutely nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so when you when you do that, uh, do you, ch- you sort of change the names to protect the innocent? Yes. Well, you can give us some real names. Yeah. Well, I sort of, the, <laughs> the, the, the people that were there, and, and most of us are still alive. We've lost one guy. Um, they'll recognize who I'm talking about. So what what was, for you, what was the uh, pinnacle or the uh, most memorable story that you've come across? Oh, boy. Uh, well, I'll tell you the story that motivates me. Uh, I read this story as a kid and made me want to be a male pilot, and not many young kids want to grow up to be male pilots. But a long time ago, there was a guy named Jack Knight, and he's sort of my hero, and they were starting the Transcontinental Mail, and it, he was snowed in completely. And it, if it didn't go, they would look like fools and they would never get funding. So he took off taxiing in a blinding snowstorm and he'd come to a fence and he'd back up a little bit, you know, turn around, take a running jump, jump over the fence, get back on the ground, taxi to the next fence. And he did that all night long. And he got the mail through. And that's, that's how we approached the mail. Uh, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, stop. I mean, we got the mail through. Period. How do you, how do you get that across in 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 your writing? Um, and, and I mean this in um, in a way of when you're when you're telling the story, how is it that you can make the reader understand kind of like what it is to fly and and the need to do what you did? Well, the the one story when Steve is coming into uh, Charleston, West Virginia, which we always call Charlie West, um, and a lot. That whole sequence of events is also very, very true, something we all experience except for the engine failure. But it, it, even the, his willingness to go do that, his drive and determination to, to attempt it, uh, and then to talk about it later as, as like, this is no big deal, this is what I do, I'm kind of hoping that that um, set the, 
the tone for for what this guy's motivation was and everybody else on the mail i never i never met a weak dick on the mail i'll tell you you ever wonder where that comes from like why why you have that in you like is it really that important the mail actually no uh but but our our i always felt that my word was like i said in the book uh that Dale, and that was his real name, he's passed away now, he gave us $190 a week in a super cool airplane, and he left us alone. So, you know, that's and he, I gave him my word I'd fly the mail, and he gave me his word he'd give me money. So we had a good deal. Yeah. So it's more about something that's inside of you. Yes. About yeah. when you say the word. It's not really about what you get out of it, like the mail or banking. It. It's just what you're saying you're going to do. Yes. And, and – and there is a tremendous satisfaction for for uh, providing that service and being reliable and having that reputation throughout the community that that's a guy there and that's a guy there and that guy over there. There are people that can be relied on. And, you know, when you're 24, 25 years old, coming up in the business, that means a lot. Yeah, I'd imagine. Um, what was the hardest thing for you to learn when you were doing that job? Ooh, not to... Uh, not to get the shit oh my. scared out of me again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but how do you, but how does that happen, right? Because we're all we're human. Right? Yeah. We all have sure. things. Well, you you, right? you have to have absolute faith in in the machine, which I did. It was a wonderful airplane. It, the, this this first airplane that I was talking about, the Navajo, uh, absolutely wonderful airplane. I had confidence in myself. I wasn't. If I couldn't do it, I would turn turn around and not do it, and I would try again later or something. But uh, I don't know. There was just this sense that uh, we were on a mission, and you you had to get the mail through. And it's been, you know, if you look back at even Pony Express days and all that stuff, there was always this: the people on the mail are just different from other people. You go into the sorting building at two o'clock in the morning in Baltimore, and those guys they've got it too. They're in there doing their job, you know, pumping it through, pumping it through, and they're not bitching and moaning about the weather or doing anything. Well, with flying, do you think you were, for you know, lack of a better word, addicted to um, the adrenaline rush? I, I'm addicted to going fast, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I used to uh, fly aerobatics and, and do air shows when I was, uh, I was 20 in the Hudson River Valley one summer. That was an adrenaline rush. But, uh, <laughs> But let me tell you a story about how you have to rely on your instruments. When I was first on the mail, it was a dark and stormy night, of course, and I'd left Richmond heading for Charlie West, and my ears and all the senses in my body told me I was in a 90-degree right bank. Everything, my whole body was screaming at me that I was in a right, right bank. But the instruments said the wings were level and I was going straight. So for about 10 minutes there, I mean, I wasn't going to listen to my body. That that kills you very quickly. I, I I just told myself the instruments are right. They've always been right. Look around. Everything's functioning normally. It's your body that's lying to you. And after a while, the, that sort of loss of equilibrium and everything settles down, and you're good to go. So Steve Barnes, how do you create that character? Like how many different people is Steve Barnes? Oh, about four, four, maybe five, yeah. And who who do you use? Um, to to create that. Well, I, I I started. I gave him a lot of my motivations and everything, um, and uh, the impossibly uh, handsome, good looks. But um, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> but you know, I'm I'm not a Vietnam veteran, and and I was very cautious about writing about that, putting my hero in that situation, and I didn't pontificate or do anything. I just talked about the experience, get in and get out, and that was based on one of my best friends, the guy that I flew the mail with, Wayne. Because he was he was uh, back from the war, he'd been wounded as a pilot, army pilot, and I never met a more easygoing, down to earth, laid back guy. You know, he just uh, he just said, "Well, okay, that was then. I, this is now. Here I am." So it, it's kind of a, an interesting type of personality that does that kind of a a job or has that kind of life. Is probably a better way of saying it. Um, when you talk about these pilots mm-hmm. and 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 how they spend their life, and even yourself, um, what's what's the best way that you could describe that to someone that doesn't fly? Uh, like, what kind of person are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my wife's still trying to figure that out. We've been married thirty-two yeah. years. So. <laughs> um, don't 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 tell her. The one 
one thing, I mean, there's going with the airlines. Of course, the ultimate oxymoron in the whole world is uh, airline security. I, I've known people who have been hired and furloughed in, in less than a month. So, And my son just got hired by one of the uh, American commuters, so I'm real happy about that. But I didn't want that. I didn't want to work for a paramilitary, semi-military thing and do, you know, Houston to Dallas six times a day. I, I, that just didn't appeal to me. You know, I wanted to go to Egypt. I wanted to fly in Africa. I wanted to see the South Pacific from a cockpit window. And there were times when, uh, yeah, I didn't have a lot of money and there was uh, the phone wasn't ringing. And then there were other times where I had to turn down things because I was busy. So it's very hit and miss. So if you're the type of person that can live with that, if, if you, I mean, the rewards are, are beyond measure. But the fears, uh, you know, am I doing the right thing? You know, my car is 10 years old. I have 50 bucks in the bank. So, and then the phone rings. Yeah. Story, story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, if, if you, if, when you're watching things like, you know, Top Gun or any of these kind of, um, wild movies or shows that kind of cover pilots or, um, whether they be in the arm or, you know, like the military, I should say, or whether they're just normal flyers or whatever you want to call them, like, and all that stuff. Do you think, do you think that they capture them, people that do that kind of thing that you did very well in, in most TV and media? No, not even close. No. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first started flying, uh, DC-3s, which would be 1977, so I was 25 years old. Young, they said I was the youngest captain in the state, but that didn't mean anything to me. I was just flying the plane that I always dreamed of flying. And a lot of the guys that I flew with, some of them were actually, uh, that ran some of the companies were actually World War II bomber pilots, and a lot of the guys I flew with were uh, spooks that flew for Air America and things like that. And those guys aren't swaggering, loud mouth, look at me, I'm a macho man kind of people. They just weren't. They were very serious. Oh, they could drink uh, They could drink just about anybody under the table. And we had a poker game going in my apartment that they shared with me that went on for about two weeks. And you just get up, go fly, you come back about 14 hours later, and somebody else would get up and you take your place. And they were they were good guys. They were all good guys, but swaggering, you know, big hair, uh, you know, not, I've never known a pilot like that. Oh, and they're not like Tom Cruise? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's done for a certain audience. It's, it, they create a character that's really, they don't have to be real. Because it's not that perfect, is it? It's not that perfect, that lifestyle. Uh, no. And, and uh, I, I would say that some of the military pilots that I meet occasionally socially uh, are absolutely like that very swaggering, very full of themselves. But I always found, and this is going to really piss a lot of people off, I didn't like flying with a lot of military pilots because they weren't very good. A lot of guys come out of the military back then anyway with 20 years, 25 years. They got 4,000 hours. I had 4,000 hours when I was 24 years old. But they are convinced that they have the best training in the world, and they don't want to listen to a long-haired hippie kid like me. But I, I, I found that sort of thing. But from the newer breed of, of military pilots. The older guys were the, were the best. I, I love flying with those guys. I miss them. Yeah, yeah. Do you, where do you think it's going in a sense of um, as we keep advancing with, you know, technology and, and computers and things like that, um, would a person flying today be, I don't want to say it as good as, but would they be the same type of flyer as you were, let's say? No, no. It, Everything now is um, there's a there's a device a computer device that superimposes itself on the flight instruments called a flight director, and I always found it very distracting. So I used to just turn it off, and it, it used to annoy people in the cockpit until they got to know me, because that's what they all needed the flight director to fly them. They couldn't feel, they couldn't uh, take in the information from the instruments, analyze it instantly, and react to it. They needed this computer. And I saw that computer when other people were flying it make a lot of terrible mistakes, and people were following it. And this, I had to take the controls away from more than one person when they were following the flight director. It's like, don't do that. Stop that. So, no. There, back then, when I was flying, you were taught to fly the wing. You were taught to fly by the seat of your pants and, and what you felt. 
and now you're not. You're taught to disregard all that stuff and pay attention to the flight director and the instruments. Yeah, so it's 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 a lot. You're relying a lot more on systems or computers maintenance, that, you know, than than your feel. Um, yeah. But you know, but when you were when you were flying, wasn't that they just invented the plane, didn't they? Or yeah, uh, well, Orville checked me out. So yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> who taught you how to fly? Was it Orville? It's the brothers that taught you how to fly. Yeah. I mean, but you know, if you if you want to talk to pilots, I recommend you go find a a grass strip someplace on a Saturday afternoon when the weather's good, or a little short runway someplace. And just go hang out and talk to the people out there, the the guys and the gals. They'll, those are pilots. They know how to fly. They they were taught properly. And it's when you start flying the bigger airplanes, you lose all of that. Or a lot of people come into the business and never fly those airplanes, and they look down on people that do. They're called flaps. Uh, yeah, you don't want to know. A few obscenities <laughs> in there. But uh, the people that say those things don't know anything about flying. I mean, they just don't. Are there still gypsy pilots like there once were, or is that a thing of the past? Oh, I imagine there's got to be a few out there. Uh, yeah, it's it's because uh, there's so much airline hiring, and people go towards the security and the boredom. But, yeah, I, I imagine there's still some people out there doing what I did, yeah. So you never wanted to do the military flying yourself? No, no. I did um, when I was really out of work and I was married, and, and I was really just – at a real low point in my life. And like I said, I grew up in the Army, and, and I'm not afraid of the military like a lot of people are. I think I understand it pretty well, the people in it. So I said, you know, I'm going to go join the Warrant Officer Flight Training Program and become a helicopter pilot in the Army. And my wife is like, no, you're not. And it's like, sweetheart, <laughs> I'm not getting any jobs. This is 1972, and there just weren't any jobs around. And the war was winding down. So with, with a couple thousand hours and all my licenses, I went down to interview, and I'd never mentioned I was a pilot. They gave me the standard Army test, and they came out, and they said uh, something. Have you ever flown? I said, yes. I told them, I'm a commercial multi-flight instructor, got 2,000 hours. And they left the room, and then they came back, and they said, we're sorry, but you didn't get a single answer right. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, okay, I'll see you later. And they said, this is one test we can't give you again, but they said, Anything else? You want to go into intelligence, military, police, uh, anything, anything? And it's like, no, thanks. If I can't fly, I'm out the door. And, it, and it's just funny. When I was doing the test, they were answer, asking questions with and saying, here's the answer, and the answer was wrong. So I gave them the right answer, and they said my right answer was wrong. So that wouldn't have gone well. That's weird. Yeah. Um, what got you into writing and writing about this sort of stuff? Like, why, why, why now? Oh, geez, I've been writing short stories and things since, uh, since junior high school. Uh, I just write for myself. I write, I have notebooks full of stuff that I write late at night when I'm flying or days off or just hanging out. Um, like I say, I, this was my first book actually that I wrote in, I think, 97 when we were out in Hawaii. I was flying for Japan Airlines and, um, I don't know. It was just exciting to, uh, cause it was all still fresh in my mind and everything. And it's, you know, they say write what you know. So I know a lot about flying. I know a little bit about smuggling drugs. So I, I mushed them together and, and came out with that one. And then the other books, the next one was driving in Budapest and we were living in Budapest. And I thought all these things kept coming to me, the, these attitudes, these people, these scenarios. And I, I just started writing and, uh, there they were. Yeah, when we talk about the uh, drug smuggling and things like that, um, planes are used a lot in that kind of a business. Um, I know, I know a lot of people, well, not personally, but I've seen it a lot <laughs> on the news where people uh, have, you know, they've smuggled drugs, let's say, from Canada to the U.S. and back and forth, and and it's always done in smaller planes and. Mm -hmm. Once in a while they get caught or, you know, they crash or there's some sort of thing and you hear about it in the news. So um, is is that still kind of a a thing that goes on? Oh, you bet, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, in one scene when they're in the uh, hangar in Columbia and Steve says to the to the mechanic there that he had flown this type of airplane before, this Lockheed Lodestar, that he had flown it at a, jumps, a jump uh, center up back in the States, and the guy smiled at him. He said, well, maybe it was this airplane. So we 
we did fly a Lockheed Lodestar to Jump Center at uh, at the New River Valley Airport in Virginia. It's a wonderful airplane. It's a lot of fun to fly. And it disappeared one night, and they found it burned to a crisp down in Georgia. Somebody's stolen it, gone to Columbia, picked up a load, land, they torch it, and run away. Isn't it kind of – isn't it hard to do that now? How do you – how can you fly a plane and not get caught with drugs? Because don't, don't you have to go through airports and fly over different territories that are monitored by airports and cities and stuff like that? Like, how, how does this happen? Well, I imagine it's, it's getting a lot harder. Technology is getting, getting better all the time for spotting stuff. And you, you have things like look down radar now, which, which wasn't even a concept back then. So if you get down to 50 feet or something, there's nobody anywhere that's going to see you, but now they do. So this is probably a wrong wow. time to make a career change and get into that business. Okay, so you're going to retire from that. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I have been approached uh, more than once with very serious offers, uh, and one was actually in a Lockheed Lodestar, and that was in that was also in 1972. And uh, you know, and well, I met, how do you handle that? Well, I I said, uh, well, I'm willing to talk to you about it, sort of like my character Steve does in the book, and he. And I went and had drinks with a, a guy that drove from New York City in a, the first DeLorean I'd ever seen. Nice guy, long hair, soft-spoken. And we talked and talked, and I said, you know, um, you know, I could be maybe talked into doing this once. I'm just saying, I'm not agreeing, I'm just saying maybe. But after that, I'm going, going on with my career. And he said, no, we, we need somebody full-time. And then I just said, no, I, I'm not available for that. He, we finished our drinks, he shook my hand, and that was that. How do you? How, but how? How do you say no? Isn't it really good money? Oh, it's extremely good money, but uh, it's it's pretty big risk. I mean, because this is the seventies too, right? They barely had radar. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and and the bad guys keep making that point to Steve. You know, he, he asked him one night, "How much are you going to make flying your mail tonight?" And Steve goes, "I don't know, hundred dollars or so." And the guy says, "I'm offering you a hundred thousand dollars to do what you do anyway." And the guy, and Steve says, "Well." Nobody shoots at me anymore, so no, yeah. no I don't want to do that. Well, it's got to be real tempting, but especially if you're broke, you have no money, and if you ha do have a wife or if you have kids or a life and you're struggling to get work, that must be a real hard thing to say no because in a, in a, in a big picture, especially in the 70s, you'd be looking at it, well, drugs are, you know, it's just drugs. Nobody's getting hurt. Like, you know, in your mind, you could say that, mm -hmm. you know. And I have known a lot of people, well, I don't want to say a lot, half a dozen or so, um, that have done it, and I'm not about to rat them out or anything, but one of the guys was killed, or two brothers down in Southern California that were sort of famous, and he was coming back in a twin beach with a load of already bricked up pot into kilos, and he hit a high-tension uh, tower in the middle of the desert, and that was the end of him and the airplane and all the dope, too, so... Uh, that's another of the hazards because you can't show lights or, or do anything like that. But, uh, you know, they, th those people were usually uh, unable to make a living in aviation any other way. They, they were kind of has-beens and washed up and outlaws and stuff, so I wasn't surprised. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it, it's just interesting. Well, I think it's one of those risks that eventually it's going to end bad somehow the longer you do something like that. Sure. And in, in the long run, you know, it's like the casino, you know, in the long run, they're going to win. And then right. smuggling yeah. in the long run, you're going to lose. And, yeah. It's, it's, it, you're going to be taken out in an awful way somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it does happen eventually. I mean, that's the way I see it. You know, I go into a casino and I win on a slot machine. I take the money and run. Yeah. And I always told people, mm -hmm. I, I finished high school and enrolled in college out there, but dropped out uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, I always told people when they asked about the casinos, I said, walk in the front door, stop for 10 seconds, and look around at the opulence of this place. They built it with somebody else's money, and they're going to use some of yours to make it even nicer. So don't go in there with anything you're not willing to walk out without, you know. Right, right, yeah. Go in with 20 bucks and... And uh, throw it away. Yeah, I usually my my limit's two hundred dollars. I like to shoot crafts, so um, but I haven't done that in years and years. I did furnish an apartment once though, but uh, I, I really haven't done it in a long time. But it's exciting. You talk about an adrenaline rush, man! Everybody's yelling and screaming, having a good time. It's fun. You've lived a life, boy! Excitement, flying, 
um, all this drinks with drug dealers yeah. and uh, did a little skydiving gambling. too, but got hurt skydiving. Oh well, <laughs> and pro- probably lots, lots of chicks. Eh, they all want to be with a flyer, right? Bad boy. Well, you know, I'm kind of a, as it says in the book, uh, I, that part of his character is all me. I, uh, I'm a quality, not quantity guy. I mean, I, I married my high school sweetheart. We broke up. I was with Sue for, uh, geez, seven or eight years, and she got killed. And then I was with another girl for eight years, and she sort of went bonkers, and then I got married. So, And in between, there was, you know, some casual stuff, but not a lot. I, and that's never been my goal is to sort of notch my holster, so to speak. That's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> but I have no, I've known some, I've known some really remarkable, remarkable women. And I'm, I've really, uh, I've really, uh, feel very fortunate in that. Yeah. Well, they were, they were the boss. Yeah. They were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, DB Cooper. What's your thoughts? Yeah. That, there was a guy who had his, uh, who had his act together. That was pretty funny. And he obviously knew that the stairs could be open in flight, which nobody who wasn't in the business would have the slightest clue. And, uh, yeah, and asking for parachutes for the flight attendants so he knew they wouldn't send up a bad one for him. And and then he went. So I don't know. They said they found his, uh, the, the, some of the money a long time ago on some river bank or something, but we'll see. But after that, it's really funny. I was flying captain on the 727, and you're doing the walk, your first walk around with the familiarization stuff, and there's this kind of flopping piece of metal on the back of the left side of the fuselage of the 72 and I said what what the hell is that thing it doesn't look very sturdy and he goes that's the DD Cooper switch and when you take off this thing fares with the wind and it shuts off the hydraulics to that door so it cannot be opened in flight and that's what they call it the DD Cooper switch <laughs> but what's your thoughts you've you've been up a lot and you you've skydived like you said and not necessarily successfully but when when you when you see that do you think that he did jump and got away just fine, or what, what kind of is that kind of possible, or is it not really, or what? What kind of what do you think? Well, a, a night jump into the forest like that, with that technology back then. Back then, they didn't have the pair, this what they call square parachutes, the para commanders and things. So he's probably jumping a round parachute with no control into the woods at, in the dark. So that that was either extremely foolish or extremely gutsy. I'm not sure which. The, I'd say the chances that he lived and got out of there is probably 50%. Plus, it was bad weather. It was like Thanksgiving, really bad wind and rain. And, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of mixed on it myself. But, well, I was hoping you'd say you were D.B. Cooper. <laughs> yeah, we used to fly together, old D.B. and me. <laughs> yeah. I thought, you were, you were, you're really D.B., that's the truth. No, I'm G.V. Know. So, or G.V. Yeah, yeah. yeah. J.B. <laughs> Cooper, that was just a play on it, you know. Uh, so are you going to do more stories like this? Are you going to continue this kind of um, true stories and maybe get into some real wild ones? I'd, I'd like to write a sequel, actually. Um, you know, I've got this journey uh, thing that I'm trying to stay up on. And I've also, you know, I'm an old guy, but I'm, I'm getting real busy all of a sudden. I've, I've started this podcast that I do every 10 days, and it's called Gary Talks too. Because my uh, Facebook page is Gary Loves to Write. So Gary talks too. And then I started one on YouTube yesterday that I'll do e- every Wednesday. And it's called Gary Talks Truth. And I'm starting a one man war on uh, talk radio, on the, the right wing propaganda machine that we all call uh, talk radio. So I, I dropped my first one uh, yesterday. And it's, I'll do it every Wednesday. And I just go after the liars and, and things and people that are spreading crap. And that's different from writing, but believe me, I do a lot of writing with that. It's all on the fly, you know, so. Well, that'll be, that'll be interesting. You know, there's a, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. I mean, um, you're going to get a lot of haters, of course, mm-hmm. as well, especially YouTube. You'll have to get on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should. I don't know. That, that would uh, I'd have to do much shorter videos though. This this was the introductory one where I introduced myself, which I won't do it again. It took it was about twenty nine minutes. I'd like to keep it to about fifteen to twenty. So that's what I'll be aiming for from now on. But I have been, uh, you know, the book ends with Steve turning to the south, obviously going back to Columbia because he said he would, and he's an airmail pilot. 
an airmail pilot say they're going to they do what they say they're going to do. So there's a lot of people in a lot of danger down there. So I, I could actually, you know, probably write a pretty good thriller uh, and then bring him back into the flying and, and have him progress, you know, from there. Maybe maybe his world gets better. I don't know. I have to play that one by ear. Yeah, you could you could you could take that place as you know, it depends on how how much of an imagination you have in, in creating uh and developing characters. Characters are really important in a story. Mm -hmm. It's what it's what keeps us uh, books alive, right? Oh yeah. They, you have to be relatable. I think everybody I go to a lot of trouble t the important characters. I mean the other ones you just sort of a brief description, but you know, like James Woodman in the Journey series and and Steve in this uh Steve Barnes in this series, you really go in depth into the person. So, uh, you know, you feel like you're, you know, somebody. And interestingly, I got an agent immediately on my first submission when I sent it out. It, he got, I still have him somewhere. I got about seven really lovely handwritten rejection notes, and all of them said exactly the same thing. They said, you have an interesting, uh, storytelling technique. There's no good guys in this book. Yeah, and that was and? it. It's like, well, what do you need a good guy? <laughs> and then Melanie Griffith and her husband at the time, Antonio Banderas, had a little indie studio in Santa Monica, and I got a card from from one of them, and it said, "Would you mind uh, if we just uh, if, would you hold this for a week before you show it to anybody else? We're going to meet with our staff and see if we can do something with it." And I was like, "Sure, go ahead." And then I got a note back from them that said, so. "Well, there's no good guys." <laughs> Well, I, 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 but you know, the thing is, if, if you get into the character enough, because even uh, nobody is all good and all bad. I mean, that's, that's pretty synthetic. That's pretty, um, you know, that's the old fashioned, you know, Lone Ranger and, you know, being the good guy and everything he does, everything is great. Then you have the Mr. Evil and, mm -hmm. and that. But the reality is when you, when you're developing characters, even the bad ones or people that do bad things, they, they do it for a reason, and you're kind of bringing out what about them thinks they're doing something good or right, you know? Right. Yeah, not, not everybody has a white hat. Not everybody's two-dimensional. And I, I think and I think it's hard, I because th I think of Steve as the hero. He's facing these odds, but he does, you know, kill people and smoke dope, so maybe he didn't quite fit their mode of what a good guy was but you, i feel like you know this guy by the end of the book i mean you actually understand really understand all his motivations and what's driving him and what kind of a person he is yeah but i i think that's what makes a good character i think that's what keeps people on the character too because there's a lot of really been a lot of really good characters over the years that don't do all good things mm -hmm. but you just know them and you follow them, and I think that's important. I think it's more realistic. Yeah, and and in the Journey series, you know, he, uh, James, who is clearly a hero to, to his family and his community, uh, he kills a lot of people too, but they're trying to kill him first. So, uh, yeah, and he doesn't enjoy it, he doesn't relish it. He's defending himself, so that's a bad thing that yeah. a good person did. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, how many bodies have you got now? Have you oh, geez, they're stacking up like cordwood. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, said, uh, how much of yourself do you have to really share? But like when you write these characters, when you're writing Steve, right, and and the good and the bad and and the ugly, you know, when you're writing all these things to make the character come alive and have people really. Um, you know, follow this character and know them, you, you kind of have to expose a lot of your own sort of good, bad, and ugly things as well. How do you, how do you manage with that? Or how does that, how does that change you when you, when you write that? Well, that's, that's good question. I, uh, I, I really do think that there's a little bit of me in most characters and maybe a lot more in Steve because I'm writing it from my position as an airmail pilot. You know, but there's a little bit of me in James. There's a little bit of me in some other of those characters. And when they're in a situation and their reaction, I got to confess, it's it's usually how I think I would react in that situation. You know, and and that's all you can do. You can't say, "Gee, I wonder what he would do." I'll just say he did this because that that just doesn't ring true. It, it's got to feel like that. And you know, when I finally, because it is a a 
a book or a series that's going to cover like 200 years, so people just die. But when uh, when James died, I, I had to go downstairs. I had tears running down my face and uh, and uh, take the rest of the day off from writing. You really get wrapped up in these guys, and you really care about them in the story. It's it's funny. I, I can't really explain why you feel it so deeply, but you're right. It, part of it is probably because there's some of me in James. Right. So you have to go downstairs and smoke pot. Yeah. <laughs> and I do that up in the office, but downstairs. Oh. I'm much <laughs> <laughs> did you know did you plan out his death or was it a surprise to you uh i knew it would have to come sooner or later and it just seemed when this incident in the forest happened with the capture and everything it just seemed like this would be the time to do it he was getting older anyway and and uh and the the, the storm was getting ready to break of the american civil war and and it was probably just did I know I was going to do it that day? No, I absolutely did not. But as I was writing, there it was. And that's, you know, again, it sort of took me by surprise. It just came up and, and it said, yes, of course, you, that's where this goes. This this event has to be in here. So, so do you, it, you're hearing voices when you do this sort of thing? <laughs> well, like I said on our last interview you, about being a wacky writer, I, I really do just create these characters and put them in a situation that I just – stand on the side and listen and listen to what happens and see how they react and a lot of of course a lot of my motivations and everything will go into those uh things those my feelings and and uh attitudes will go into these interactions but uh, i really do feel like uh i'm listening to them they're helping me write this story i, I know that sounds kind of uh new agey but but that's the way it works yeah. for me well, you know, just approach with caution if you get into a plane that Gary's flying. That's all. <laughs> if he's hearing voices at the time yeah. that he's flying. Well, usually it's through my headset, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's, you know. Uh, so, well, that's that's good. That's really good. Um, do, you, do you ever worry about how people feel? When they when they're going to read these stories, do you, do you ever think about the reader? Uh, just uh, in descent, because I really don't want my kids to read it. But oh, you're like Madonna, right? You yeah. do these wild things and then have a kid, and then oh no, you can't watch what I did. No, and uh, um, but my oldest daughter has already told me she's going to read it, and she's got a copy. So, and I'm sure the other ones will too. They're 29 and 31 they're old enough to but i was just i'm not encouraging them to do so right well you don't want them to find out you're wearing like silk panties with diamonds on it <laughs> <laughs> and it's the singing part that drives everybody crazy so. yeah i would i can <laughs> i can see it now i can see it now you know so let's talk about your social media and, and talk about where people find you and of course your podcast where they find everything about you Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, of course, I've got the website, www.gvbwrites.com. Those are my initials, GVB. And the podcast is Gary Talks Too. And don't forget the comma or you won't find it. It's on uh, Spotify, Apple, and Google. comes out every 10 days. Uh, this new YouTube launch was yesterday, and it's called Gary Talks Truth. And uh, then on the regular things, Facebook is... Uh, Gary loves to write, and both Twitter, or should I say X? I was thinking of calling it Twixter from now on. Um, Excrement. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, at Reader Reclusive, as same on Instagram at Reader Reclusive. And I I love to hear from people. I love people writing in, whether they're mad at me for a character or or uh, saying nice things about it. Uh, it, it's just nice to get a reaction, a feedback. It really does feel good. Right. Uh, well, of course, we'll put all that up on our website well, okay. so people Great. can find you easy. And, and you know, it, you, you can always give out Dave's email address if you want for the people that have complaints. <laughs> That's all what does. Yeah, the complaint file, and then you just put his email address, yeah. and it all yeah. goes there. I'll just put a link on my website. Uh, yeah, just, and then they can <laughs> click, and they can send all their hate stuff. And thanks, Dave. Yeah. I have protesters outside my window right now. <laughs> Gives them my address. 
Yeah. Well, that's that's for the extreme cases. Yeah. That's for the <laughs> yeah mega mega. I give out his address. No. Go here. He's, he, uh, yeah. he's the most uh, dangerous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Well, anyway. Well, we appreciate you being here. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks, Alan um, and Dave. Both. It's uh, I enjoy talking to you. Um, you 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 make this whole thing very easy. I got to say, yes. You know, just keep rolling right along, and it's very well, very nice. It's what I do. You yeah. know, I'm an old guy too. So yeah, uh, I just didn't fly. I just talk. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, the book is called Descent, and it's a novel based on several true stories. And the writer has been our guest, Gary V. Brill. Um, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Gary. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This is here production of something weird media. I'll be back.